Welcome to Redeemer Church this morning. My name is Gina. It's my privilege to welcome you. Um, it's your first time visiting with us. Welcome especially. Um, if you have questions or need something, don't hesitate to just grab someone that's warm or real. Okay? Um, a couple of things I want you to be aware of. Uh, the first one is in a couple of weeks, Sunday, May 9th. We will have another baptism service in our 10 o'clock service. Um, and I know there are some of you who have been thinking about baptism, especially as we've baptized a couple times in the last month or so. Several of you have mentioned that you're kind of thinking about it or, or wondering more about it. If that's you, please don't hesitate to uh, send us a message, um, email us, drop a little note in the giving basket. Uh, for Cole or myself, and we would love to sit down and talk with you more about baptism. We'll be doing that again May 9th uh, here in the 10 o'clock service, and so if you want to be a part of that, we have a few uh, who've made that decision, and so we would love to add you to the list if you're ready. Also, that Sunday, if you ordered Redeemer gear online, it will be ready to pick up here at the theater uh, on the 9th as well. The other big event coming is next Sunday, May 2nd, we will celebrate Redeemer Church's third birthday uh, in what I like to call Redeemer Palooza. Okay, so you are invited to Redeemer Palooza next Sunday. We will have just one combined service at 10 a.m. and we will be at the Riley Pavilion at Rothwell Park. So if you're not familiar with the park, Riley Pavilion is on the west side of the park, nearest to the Aquatic Center. Uh, we will join there for service, one combined service at 10 o'clock. Bring your own chair, okay? There are some bleachers, they are not comfortable. So uh, bring your own chair, all right? Uh, we'll join together there for worship. And then after our service, we will have our annual family meeting. If you've joined with us in Membership Covenant, we'll ask that you uh, vote and approve our annual budget. And then um, we'll have lunch together. The church will provide hamburgers and hot dogs. We're just asking that you bring a side dish to share. And then we'll have some games. There's a petting zoo. So look forward to that. Um, and uh, we'll just have an afternoon of fun, okay? Cole's excited about kickball, so if you would love to play him in kickball. <laughs> go, um, I mean, it's happening. So we invite you to <laughs> join in. Uh, we are uh, we're just looking forward to a day of hanging out together as a church family and celebrating all that God has done in these last three years. Um, I can't talk a lot about it. I'll get overwhelmed, and then that will be awkward for all of you. So, um, but we want you to come and be a part of that. Uh, in preparation for that, our annual budget proposal is available to you today back on the giving table. So if you are a member, or if you're not and you're just curious what happens with our giving, um, it's back there, okay? You can take a look at that. If you are a member, we would ask that you pick one of those up today so you can be looking over it this week and have time to pray about that before the meeting next Sunday. Bring your own chair. Party, petting zoo, kickball, food. I got it. I was checking my notes and I got all the things, okay? Also, because next Sunday is the first Sunday of May, we will have the Christmas store donation tubs at the park if you have things that you've been spring cleaning and are ready to give. Uh, remember, we'll be collecting those for Sunday of each month all year long in preparation for that. So again, we're so glad that you're here this morning. Thanks for choosing to worship with us. Let me pray with you, and we're going to worship together. God, thank you once again for an opportunity to gather in your house with your people, with your church and your name. God, this morning is all about you. Father, we've come here to worship you, to glorify your name, to hear from your word, to be drawn closer to you. So for the next couple of hours, would you help us set aside all the distractions of the world, all the things that grab for our attention, 
all the distractions maybe even that we brought into this place with us today. God, would you help us set them aside in our minds and in our hearts so that we can fix our attention on you and you alone. God, we anticipate your presence in this place this morning. Thank you for inviting us to join you here. Would you speak to us today? And as we leave here, would you speak through us to a community that desperately needs to know you? God, we love you. We're thankful. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Let's stand this morning as we're going to worship and sing. Is there a better place to be than here this morning? I can't hear you respond. We're in the Father's house. Let's sing that this morning. Yeah. 
to you today. We just thank you so much that you are in control, that you are sovereign. We put you, Lord, in the driver's seat.
and they are really concerned with their outward religious expressions and what other people will think of them if they eat certain foods or if they don't wash their hands in a certain way. Will that, will other people judge them because of it and will it make them unclean before God? And here is Jesus' response. Rita, can you reset the timer? And he said to them, are you also still without understanding? Says this. What he says is, don't you understand? There you go. Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? And then he says to him this in verse 17, or 18. But what comes out of the mouth, it proceeds not from the mouth, but from the heart. And this is what defiles a person. If you read on in this chapter, he's going to go on and tell you about some real kind of nasty things that we as people do. Thoughts that we have, but more importantly, actions that we commit. He's going to talk about things like murder and, and, and lying and, and, and adultery and all these things. And he's going to say that these things ultimately, these actions come from your heart. <coughs> What he's saying is that all of them started with a thought. All of these things that come out of your life that you never wanted anyone else to see, things that gross things that you see in other people that you think, wow, that's that's horrible. It doesn't seem like them, it's out of character. They all started with a single thought, right? This should cause those of you that are in the stage of life where you are um in meaningful relationship with someone and you're trying to figure out if this is the person that you are called to spend your life with. Passages like this should cause you to take a deeper look and here's why. Because that individual, that boy or that girl, that you during this time are head over heels in love with and they treat you really well most of the time. But it's only when you fill in the blank situation arises where they tend to act in a way that you never see them acting any other time. And they excuse away their pattern of behavior. They excuse away their words. They excuse away their fists. They excuse away their screaming. They excuse away their demeaning. They excuse it away. And they say, I'm sorry. It was an accident. I didn't mean it. People around you were saying, man, that doesn't seem like them. Telling you, Jesus is saying, that's the only them I know. Watch them. Because what's happening is you're seeing what's in their heart. Mm -hmm. And it's the same for you. These things are in your heart. And so when I ask the question, what would you do if you could get away with it? You're not daydreaming. You're removing the filter for a second. Right. You're saying, well, if no one would catch me, let me tell you who I really am. It's like, and I've done this before with you, if I asked you how much money it would take to cause you to sleep with someone else or cheat on your spouse or, or whatever that might be, and I ever hit a financial number where you say yes, we've already established what you are, we're just negotiating your price. Right? And for most of us, that causes us to go, yuck. Yeah. Because here's the truth of it, and some of you have seen this illustration and some of you haven't. Sometimes life shakes us, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And if I shake this soda bottle, man, I can feel it just getting ready to explode, by the way, right? You guys up front. And, uh, <laughs> you ready, Rita? <clears throat> if I shake it really hard, right? If I shake this soda bottle up really hard, and I pop that lid, you want to know what shaking it didn't do? It didn't change the contents of what's in there, did it? I didn't shake it and make it something it wasn't. I just shook it and got it under pressure enough where it's getting ready to shoot out what it is. What's in you? What's in the people around you? This is why you and I should really heed Solomon's advice that he gives us in the book of Proverbs. Solomon, when he writes the book of Proverbs, he is, uh, Scripture tells us, the wisest man that has ever lived. 
and he writes down wisdom. Divinely inspired by God to write down wisdom. And in Proverbs chapter 4, he's not only sharing general wisdom, he's sharing wisdom with the people that are most important to him. In, in, in Proverbs chapter 4, we see Solomon talking to his kids like he's on his deathbed. Because he says this. Listen to me. Take heed of my words. Find life in them, right? He says these words. And in Proverbs 4 verse 23, he says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, or in some of your translations, above all else. More important than anything else, he says, Guard your heart. For from it flow the springs of life. Some translations say, for it is the wellspring. Your heart is the wellspring of your life. It's the thing that feeds your life. And so he tells his kids, he says, listen, um, you need to know something more than anything else. You need to guard your heart because what you let in there is going to destroy you and destroy others. Let me say it to you this way. What's in your heart will ultimately spill out on those around you. You ever seen this? You ever been a part of this? And so you say, Cole, what are we talking about today? Today we're going to talk about um, something that in the life of every believer needs to die but I would say that most believers so grossly misunderstand the topic that they don't even realize they struggle with it. And because of that, this thing for a lot of us in this room has become your master. And this is the sin of guilt. It's guilt. So what's our working definition of the term guilt? Guilt is the emotion associated with acknowledging that we have done something wrong. It's the emotion that's associated with us owning the fact that we are in the wrong. And, and so you say, Cole, there's, there's lots of types of guilt. I've read about them, and, you know, there's false guilt. And I'm not talking about that fake humility, false guilt that says, oh, I did it. That's my bad so that someone will forgive you. But really, you haven't looked at it at all. You haven't felt the weight of it. You just kind of pass it on. We're not talking about fake guilt at all. What we're talking about is the guilt, um, the real guilt, the guilt that in the depth of your soul, you know, I did it. That's me. Not only did my sin hurt me, but my sin hurt those around me, and it's mine. I own it. I did it. We are dealing with guilt this morning, the type of guilt that causes us to retreat from certain situations because we can't handle um, the weight of it. We're, we're dealing with the type of guilt that for a lot of you in this room, and this may be an identifier to you, causes you to desperately want to control the narrative, a.k.a. how people are talking about the situation and how they're talking about you. Because you don't want to be seen in the light. And so you're desperately trying to control what people are saying so that it doesn't overwhelm you, so that the guilt isn't too much, right? In your life, rather than feeling a certain way, many times you see this exemplified or, or um, spoken about even in these terms. You ever heard somebody say something like this or been part of it? And I know what I did was wrong, but I was just a kid. I didn't understand. I was just a teenager. I didn't understand. I was in my 20s. It wasn't a good choice. Um, I didn't know better, and so I did it. Um, it just felt right at the time, but now I can tell that it's wrong. It's how my parents did it, so that's the way I did it. Or in my life, you want to know where I find myself dealing with this a lot? I wasn't a Christian yet. I wasn't a Christian yet. I didn't know any better. But there's guilt. There's guilt. You see, here's the problem, and this is why guilt is, is such a big deal. Because this guilt that most all of us in this room at times struggle with, we tend to struggle with it in one or two ways that are both very unhealthy. 
We tend to either deny it or allow it to define us. And let me just tell you something. Denying it, denying guilt, or being defined by guilt empowers the guilt. You see that, right? Denying that it exists when it does and allowing it to rule your life from the background or allowing everyone else, including yourself, to define your life by an event gives the guilt power that it does not deserve in your life. You know what it becomes? It becomes a boss or a master to you. Your guilt does, right? Here's what it actually creates. And for those of you that I have done either premarital counseling with or marital counseling with, you've probably heard me talk about this. It creates one of the most dangerous relationships in the world, and that is a debt-debtor relationship, meaning that in that relationship, any relationship that you have that operates under a debt-debtor heading, it means this, that someone in the relationship is holding the debt and someone in the relationship owes the person that's holding it over them. Mm -hmm. How many of your marriages work like this? Where you're keeping score. Who's winning, by the way? She is, right? She's, she's winning. <laughs> See, because here's what happens, or at least this is our understanding. When you do something wrong, you take something from someone else, right? And because of this, you owe them. You say, I, I owe them an apology, or I'm not sure how I can make it up to them. And I get it. Don't hear me stating that that's incorrect. When you wrong somebody, you should do everything within your power to make it right. But you think if you can just alleviate the feeling of guilt, that it makes everything okay. But here's the problem with guilt. You and I, when we experience, not when we think about, when we experience guilt, we don't experience guilt as debt. You don't normally experience guilt as debt. You want to know how you experience it? You experience it as weight. When you're guilty, you feel the weight of it, don't you? It feels heavy. It just falls all over you. And sometimes you feel like you can't breathe, like you have to do something to get it off of you. The guilt is heavy. That's why people that struggle with guilt many times say this when they temporarily figure out a way to get rid of the feeling. I feel like a weight has been lifted off of me. Because guilt feels heavy. And it's why some of us in our relationships, and this is crazy, but as I've done some studying about this, this is what's crazy. I see this outlined in scripture, and I see it outlined um, under biblical counseling. Here's what's actually taking place. For a lot of us who struggle with guilt, here's what actually happens. It causes us to be overly passive-aggressive. Okay? Meaning this, that um, in our parenting relationships, in our relationships with our spouse, in our relationships with our friends, that we are overly passive aggressive, meaning we don't ever really want to engage anything, but we want to say words that have weight to them so that we can manipulate and get people to respond to us in the way that we want them to because we feel like they owe us something because when we're guilty, we feel like we owe someone something and we're just trying to figure out if I'm mad at me for what I've done, then you ought to be mad at you for what you've done. And so because of that, I'm going to manipulate all the situations. It throws us off balance. That's what weight always does, right? Mm -hmm. If you carry around too much weight, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's good, wouldn't it? It throws you off balance. You weren't created to carry weight like that. You see, this weight, it goes everywhere with us. This weight of guilt, it goes everywhere with us. You can't ever check out of it. You don't get to just take it off and lay it down when you want to. It affects every relationship and every interaction that you have in life. And here's the real problem. This guilt, it many times turns into anger or resentment. Here's why. 
because you finally get to the point where you realize that you didn't live up to your expectations of you, and now no one can live up to your expectations. Let me say that to you again so you can feel what I felt at about midnight when God said it to me. The reason it's so dangerous is because, because of your guilt. You realize that you didn't live up to your expectations of yourself. So now, no one in life live up to your expectations of them. You, you become overly critical. Um, I've got some friends and we like to say that we're not judging, we're just evaluating, right? You ever been there? I'm not judging, I'm just evaluating. No, you're being overly critical. And it probably stems from the fact that you're critical of yourself as well. And because you can't forgive you, you can't forgive other people. Guilty people rarely ever make the connection between their guilt and their frustration or anger. Because here's what happens. Their failures, these things that cause them to feel the guilt, their failures disappear into the weight or the recess of their heart while everyone else's failures are plain for them to see. You see any of yourself in that statement? You see, we rarely as believers ever set out and, and get to the point of addressing our problem with guilt. And here's why. Because there's no fix or recourse. If you're sitting here this morning and you're like, fine, I get it. God has revealed to me this morning that I am guilty. But Cole, here's the problem. If I own that guilt, if I say, yeah, I'm guilty, I did it. Then when I say it out loud, guess what doesn't happen? It doesn't go away, right? Right. There's no fix or recourse to your guilt. But here's the problem. For many of us who claim to be followers of Christ, who claim to understand the good news of the gospel... This guilt translates into us feeling condemned. It goes from guilt to condemnation. <clears throat> Meaning we have to pay for what we've done. The guilt has become so heavy that we now feel like we stand condemned before God and before others. And we've got to make it right somehow, right? Like we have to do it. And here's the problem. When you look at the situation, when you look at guilt in your life, it stems from the fact that you're guilty. Let me just tell you something. You're guilty. I'm guilty. There is no one in this room who's not guilty guilty of wrongdoing. It's not there, right? And here's the kicker. Just because you can identify it doesn't undo it, right? Here, listen to me. Let me say this to you. You can't undo what you've done. You can't undrink the drink. You can't unlie the lie. You can't uncheat the relationship. You can't unsteal. You can't unlive you can't undo. Mm -hmm. You can't. So what do we do? We create a narrative so that the weight of our guilt doesn't overwhelm us. But here's the problem. There's a lot of people out there that think that the way to deal with it is just to forget what has happened in the past. And I just want to let you know that's empty and you can't do it. You want to know why? Because the past wasn't meant to be left behind. Your past was not meant to be forgotten. In scripture it tells us that God in his omniscience, that his, in his omnipotence, <clears throat> In his love for us, that he is able and willing in Jesus, watch this, 
to view our sin and to take that sin and cast it as far away as the east is from the west and remember it no more. And that is what God can do. It is not what you can do. You were never called to do it. It is not a biblical understanding that you would ever be able to do it. It is not part of the good news of the gospel that you would forget your past, that you would walk away from your past, that your past wouldn't change you, that your past wouldn't cause you to reflect. Listen, we realize that if we don't learn from history that we're deemed to repeat it, right? That's not just good information from the world that very much has a biblical understanding that we have to learn from what our guilt has taught us, right? But here's the great thing, and this is where it becomes good news, right? We don't preach sermons without good news. Right. I don't want you to leave out here feeling guilty. <laughs> I know some of you guys are like, I don't think so cool. I've heard you preach before. I think that's what you're doing. It's not what I'm doing. Your spouse didn't write me a letter. I'm not preaching what they told me to, unless they paid me enough. And I will. Here's the good news. You don't have to be defined by your past. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to live in your past, right? right? You don't have to. You don't have to be defined by your past, and you don't have to live in your past. There's a third option that God graciously gives all believers. He graciously gives all believers this third option in Scripture. And here's the amazing thing about how he does it. He does it by using a man who has... More reason to feel guilty than all of us in this room combined. God teaches us this truth through the hands of a man by the name of the Apostle Paul. Who before he was the Apostle Paul was a murderer by the name of Saul of Tarsus. He was a religious leader. And he was in the business of killing people that claimed to believe in this Messiah, the Christ. And his means for killing them was incredibly horrific. He would have them stoned. Mm -hmm. He would surround men, women, and children who claimed to be believers or followers of Christ. He would surround them with a circle of individuals, with a circle of men who held rocks. And they would throw rocks at this individual who claimed to be a believer until one rock hit them in such a way that it was a lethal blow and they died. Can you imagine the agony if they were bad shots? Hours of being pummeled by large rocks in the face, knocking your teeth out, breaking your nose. And he heard the screams. He heard those men, women, and children scream and scream for their life. And he murdered them in cold blood. And scripture tells us that on the road to Damascus, he's going along and Jesus himself speaks to him. God calls him out. Says, why are you persecuting me? shares truth with him, gives him a calling and a passion. And Saul of Tarsus surrenders his life to this heavenly father that would call him out and redirect his footsteps. And he becomes the apostle Paul, a leader in the church. God uses him to write 33% of the New Testament. One out of every three books in the New Testament is written through the hands of Paul, divinely inspired by God. And this Paul, who felt the weight of murdering Christians, not just a few of them, he didn't polish his story. Right. He didn't excuse it away. He didn't say it was before I was a believer. He didn't make any excuses when he became a Christ follower here's the words that he wrote for some of y'all you need to hear this you ready yeah. Romans 8 1 here's what he says <clears throat> there is 
therefore now no condemnation. None. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Yes. And that means you, if you're in Christ Jesus. You tell me what you're bringing to the table that causes you to have more guilt than that man who God used. He not only had to believe it to be true, he had to write the words. Yeah. And he says, therefore, meaning because of what Christ has done, therefore, there is now now. Why does he say now? Because it's a new day. It's a new time. It's a new covenant. Because what, of what Christ has done for you, your past is neither forgotten. You can't forget it. Your past isn't forgotten. But your past is also not condemning. There's no pretending it didn't happen. You're guilty. I'm guilty. Whatever that guilt is, you can own the guilt. But in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. None. Amen. None. Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free mm -hmm. in Christ Jesus. And what has it set you free from, Paul says? From the law of sin and death. Why? Because here's what the law of sin does. The law of sin tells you that when you sin, when you mess up, when you fall short, when you do the thing, you're stuck. And there's nothing you can ever do to get out of it. But check out the beginning of verse 3. Watch this. For God has done what the law Weakened by the flesh could not do. I like the translation of scripture that says it this way. For what the law was powerless to do. Christ is done. That's right. You know what the law does? It points out, it charges, it tells you where you've fallen short, and it condemns. The law says you're guilty, deal with the consequences. Paul tells us elsewhere in scripture, he says, the law is beneficial because the law is what made me aware of my guilt, of my wrongdoing, that I had been in rebellion towards God. He says without the law, I don't understand those things. We need the law. But what he's saying is this, the law in and of itself is it's rubbish. The law in and of itself, all it does is make you realize how broken and busted you are, and it doesn't speak about the truth of the gospel, that there's one who's not broken and busted, that allowed himself to be broken and busted for you. That's right. Yes. For you. When God sent Jesus for us, look at what he did in the second half of Romans, verse 3 here, in, in 3b, if you will, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. This is why Jesus, when he comes to earth, puts on flesh and is born as a human. He's still carrying full deity, but he's, he's born in flesh. Because he had to be born in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. If he wasn't flesh, he couldn't condemn sin in the flesh. Here's the, re here's the deal. He didn't just send Jesus to teach us how to live and how to love. That's nice, but that wasn't Jesus' primary role. Jesus' role was not just to teach you to live, how to live, and how to love. Jesus' primary role is to set you free. Listen to me. That was weak. We're going to yeah. be here until like 2.30 in the afternoon, right? Yeah. What? Bring it. Say it. Because you want to know who I'm not supposed to be talking to? A majority of people who don't understand the good news. Yeah. You haven't become so numb to the good news that it's not good news anymore, have you? Mm. Don't make me stand up here and get on my knees and pray. <laughs> That God would send calamity in your life and break you until you realize the goodness of Jesus. Hmm. It's better for you to give God the glory when it's due him. 
Yeah. Not when he forces you to bend your knee. Does that make sense? Yeah. Listen to me. I'm not asking about your public response in a sermon. I could care very little about that, but here's what I do know. Somewhere along the way, a lot of us have been deceived into believing the lie mm -hmm. that the good things that we have are because we've done good and the bad things we have are because we're do them and we forget that it's called good news for reason. And you want to know how good news should cause you to respond? <laughs> like someone just told you good news. That's right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I know we've said if you're happy and you know it, tell your face. If you're forgiven and you know it, tell your face. That's right. Right? Yeah. There comes a point where I'm sick and tired of believers walking around like this. People all the time would come up to me in the beginning days of Redeemer and, and Redeemer and they're like, Cole, you're so passionate about me. I had a person one time literally at the back doors of the church. I loved everything about it. They said, you're so passionate. It's like you actually believe what you're preaching. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. It has nothing to do with me and it has everything to do with us. Yeah. I don't think people are offended because their pastors doesn't preach like Cole preaches. I don't think that's what's happening. I think people are offended because their church, their body of Christ, their tribe doesn't look like Jesus has saved them from anything. Yeah. And they're like, Thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done. I put my five dollars in the plate. Let's go to heaven. Ouch. Church, what are we doing? Yeah. What are, what are we doing? Listen. The good news of the gospel is that you are guilty. Yeah. And he took it. Right. Amen. He didn't take away your guilt. That's a consequence of sin. You're going to have to live with that. You can't erase bad decisions. It doesn't make your tears go away at night. Jesus isn't a magic genie. He didn't die to make you feel better. Right. He died to make you free. Amen. And here's the deal. This condemnation... The fact that you shouldn't be free. The fact that you ought to be locked up and go to hell. Yeah. Because of your rebellion. Jesus said, I got that. Because right. you can't carry it and you can't pay it. Right. But he says, I can. Amen. And I choose to because I love you. Yeah. That's why it's good news. That's why I'm sick and tired of people telling me, well, I can't talk to my neighbor about it. What do you think you're trying to do? Sell them encyclopedias? What are you trying to convince them of? If you can just out-debate them? God uses stupid people to share the gospel. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see the video last week on Facebook? The Jesus leaving the 99 to find the one sheep falling in the crack? Yeah. Did you see it? Yeah. Did it make you angry? Because you knew it was you? She is head first in a crack, this wide, butt hanging out, right? Feet kicking up. I mean, he's going down. Shepherd, good shepherd, comes up, grabs him by the feet, pulls him up out of the crack. Sheep is so excited, he's like, you know, he jumps. I'll do it again later if I don't hurt myself. He jumps along the fence. He gets about 10 feet. He jumps back in the crack. And I'm like, that's my church. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't think that. I looked at Gina and I said, that's stupid, I didn't even say anything. Because uh -huh. <laughs> it's me. Yep. And there's no condemnation. Amen. God's not sitting up on his throne going, I'm going to slap Cole upside the head when he gets here. <laughs> I'm going to make him pay for the fact that he just doesn't get it. <laughs> Some of you guys still think that's who God is. Mm. You know, that's who you are. It's not who he is. He didn't say he was a broken and busted shepherd. He's a good shepherd. Amen. You're not good. Some of you guys are offended by that statement. Like it's new news. <laughs> not doing it right. 
He took all the condemnation Jesus did for you. He took the divine condemnation. That is the condemnation that should have been poured out on you by God. He took the self-condemnation, the part of you that wants to make you pay for what you've done. You don't have any business doing that. It's already been paid. He took all the condemnation. And Paul says to the church, to believers, he's not talking to people who aren't believers. He's talking to the church. He says, therefore, because of what Christ has done, there's no condemnation. He says, bring it to God. Bring it to him. And both God and you can agree. Guess what? You're guilty. God isn't going to argue with you. When you say, God, look at all the bad things I've done. God's going to go, yep. (laughs) Yep. That's not what no condemnation means. That's no guilt. You're guilty. I'm guilty. You are guilty. You actually did it. It was actually you. Quit trying to excuse away the fact that you are a liar and a cheat and you're mean and you're self-centered and you do all types of things. You have broken up relationships. You have broken up households. You have said hurtful things. You have turned people away from the church and away from Jesus. Do I need to keep going? You've done it. I've done it. We've done it. we got two choices. We can either sit here, we can sit in a circle and sing kumbaya, talk about how broken we are, and or we can rejoice and give praise and worship to the one that is doing because even though we have done all of those things, he has paid the penalty for our stupidity. Yeah. For our sin and our rebellion, there is no condemnation. Because here's the deal. You're guilty, but you're not condemned. Let me say it to you in a way that some of you need to hear. Everyone look at me for just a second. We're getting ready to close. Band, come up. Listen to me. Here's what God is saying. When I see you, I don't see that. Amen. Amen. Because it's all you can see. And you think it's all everyone else can see. And you know when you walk into a room that they're talking about you. And you know that that's what God's looking at. And you know that you failed him. And you know you've made this horrible choice. And, and you're saying, God, I know when you look at me, you look at me as this thing. And God says, no, 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 no. No, don't you devalue what my son did on that cross for you. I see you, but I don't see that. I see you as washed and made clean by the blood of my son. The price for that wrongdoing has already been paid as well. Because here's what verses 3 and 4 say when you read them together. Check this out. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Now watch this, verse 4. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, not by us, but in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So he says, it's fulfilled on your behalf, not because of what you've done, but in spite of you. That's good news. You say, so what do I do with this? Note takers, you ready? We're going to be quick. I got four points, but you're going to have to write. This is a big deal, and here's why. And here's why it's such a big deal for believers to understand What does this mean for us? Number one, you, as a born-again follower of Jesus, you forfeit the right to condemn yourself because you are not yours to condemn. It's better preaching than what you heard, so listen to it again. You, as a believer, forfeit the right to condemn yourself. You forfeit it. It does not belong to you. You don't get to condemn yourself because you're not yours to condemn. Whose are you? Say it out loud. You're whose? Scripture tells us you don't belong to you. You were purchased. You were bought with a price. Scripture says that when you surrender to Jesus, that you're no longer the boss or the master. He is. He gets to condemn you, not you. And he says you're not condemned. So we've got a problem when you keep living in condemnation. Because you're still trying to be the boss. And you don't have that power. You've actually lost that job description. 
Number two, your guilt should remind you it should not define you. You let your guilt and wrongdoing do what it's supposed to, to remind you not to chase rebellion again. To not chase selfish wrongdoing again. Stop. When you see those warning signs, when you see those things, when that accountability comes in your life and says, you remember what happened the last time you did this? Quit telling people, I can do better this time. I can own it. I can deal with it. No, you can't. But you're also not the sum of your mistakes. You're a born-again follower of Jesus. You are a new creation in Christ. And those old things have passed away. All things have become new. The only way you're going to be old is if you, quit, if you keep ignoring your past and going back to old stuff. And praise the Lord that even when you do it, even when you jump in the crap, there's a good shepherd that grabs you by the hind legs and pulls you out again. You want to know what this means? That your worst day, that event, that time when that happened, that thing that you're carrying the guilt over, whatever it is, I don't need to know it. Don't come up afterwards and be like, Cole, I want to tell you all the things. I don't need to know. I will listen to you and I will give you a hug, but I don't need to know. Because my forgiveness doesn't mean anything. His does. And in Christ, you're forgiven. But that time, that thing that you're thinking of, that you're like, this is what I have to protect against people knowing. This is what I can't go back to. This is where the whole thing fell apart. This is where the guilt comes in. Listen, the devil wants to point that out to you and make it a central focus point. You want to know one of the first things they teach you in motorcycle riding? That whatever you focus on, that is where you will go. So they teach you, when you're riding through a turn, not to focus on one single point. Because you want to know what's going to happen? The turn will make it, and you won't. You're going to hit it. And some of you guys, you're doing this with your life. You're focused on this thing, and it's shipwrecking your faith. You keep crashing into it because you keep focusing on it. When really, it's a pivot point. And if any of you guys are thinking about the show Friends right now, you should be, right? Pivot. Pivot. It's a pivot point, right? It should be that point where you realize what has taken place for you and it makes you turn the opposite direction. It makes you pivot and head toward that which he has called you to. Yeah, I'm broken and I'm busted. And God says, yeah, you are. Now go. Pivot, right? Jesus says, he says it this way to a group of disciples. He says, you guys are you're so worried about, about all these things, about who's going to get this place and that place and whatever. And he says, can I just teach you something? Um, he, he was talking about money, but it also talks about life. He says, you know what you need to understand? That he who has been forgiven much, forgives much. Meaning this. The more broken and busted your story is, the more reason you have for guilt, the more Apostle Paul-like you are, the greater capacity you have to forgive and to love. You think that everything that took place in your life is an accident. And God's just preparing to do a work in you and through you that a lot of people can't carry. Your past is a pivot point. Think about it this way. It's a launching path. For those of you that are musical, and I'm not, so I'm not going to sing it, because that would be bad. The great hymn, Amazing Grace, very famously says the line, I once was blind. It doesn't say I'm still blind. It says I once was blind. But baby, I got on that launching pad. Now I can see. Number three, you're not going to like this. We don't even talk about it much. You forfeit the right to condemn others because that would make you a hypocrite. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Whoever you is, I'm talking to you. When you realize how much you've been forgiven, you forfeit the right to condemn others. You forfeit the right to sit on your throne of pointing out or evaluating other people's mistakes. Because that makes you a hypocrite. Stop it. You're so critical. It's because you're guilty. It's the only reason that you're critical. It's because you're guilty and you can't stand you. So you're pointing out everybody else's sin. And some of you guys right now, you're like, that's making me mad. Okay. 
Because here's the deal, the more judgmental you are, the less aware you are of your sin, right? I'm telling you, when you get to this point, you are perfectly positioned to forgive others. Number four, you are free to make restitution without expectation and without excuse. You see, you didn't think you were getting out of here without talking about restitution, did you? In my family, here's what it looks like when, when we talk to our children and there's wrongdoing and someone has hurt feelings. Um, I don't want my kids to go to bed feeling guilty. That's not my goal. Please don't be that type of parent that tells your kids how wrong they are so they go to bed and they cry about it. What if God did that to you? But they do have to own their sin and they do have to make restitution. Because you know what the restitution does? It doesn't remove the sin. They can't pay the price for their sin, but they can do whatever it takes to make it right. So here's what we say. When one of our kids sins against the other one, normally it's my son Jack against his sister Zaley, right? <laughs> or Gina against me, but we'll talk about that later. Um, we say, are you willing to do whatever it takes to make it right? And if they say no, we say try again. But here's the deal. Some people have this false view of Christianity that thinks it's, um, I hurt you, I go home and I pray about it, I confess it to God, I get up off my knees and I'm good. You know where God doesn't say that? In the Bible. You know what Christianity is? It's I hurt you, I get on my knees and cry out to God for forgiveness. He offers forgiveness immediately. I'm overwhelmed by his forgiveness. I run to you to make restitution. I run to you to make it right. I don't ever think, man, grace ought to cover everything I've done so I shouldn't have to do anything for it. That's grace offered from God to you. You make restitution. Not because you're trying to earn anything, but because you're trying to love other people the same way he loves you. Amen. You forgive others when they're unforgivable. You forgive others when they don't forgive you or when they don't deserve it. And here's what I just want to let you know. When you start doing this, when you start going to people and you start offering restitution, here's what's going to happen. You're going to go to people that you wronged years ago that you're like, I, listen, it happened. It's in the past. I'm trying to move on. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit's going to convict you and you're going to leave here and you're going to go, I'm going to go make it right. And when you get to them and you do whatever it takes to offer forgiveness, it's going to unlock a vault of bitterness in their heart. And you're going to see things out of them you didn't want to see. And you're going to go, Cole, it didn't work. You're not supposed to offer them restitution with exception or excuse. You don't offer it so that you get what you think you deserve. You offer it because it's the right thing to give them. It's the God-honoring thing to give them. And you leave the results to him. And you want to know the problem is, is this morning, for a lot of us that feel this guilt, We're having a hard time believing that Jesus has already paid for it. And hear me. We really don't want to do this. Because we're prideful above all else. So let me ask you a question you don't want to hear. And I don't want to ask. But if you put that up there. Is someone waiting for you to act first? is the key to removing bitterness, anger, and weight in someone else's life. You being willing to lay down your pride enough to go to someone in humility and do whatever it takes to make it right. That's what it looks like to walk with Jesus. That's what it looks like to follow him. So let me ask you something. You ready to stop playing games? If you are, I just
just want to remind you of something as you leave. And this is what the enemy does not want us to be reminded of. My past will remind me. It will not define me. Why don't we say that out loud together? You ready? My past will remind me. It will not define me. So quit letting it. It's not your boss. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And right now, um, I don't have any idea what you're going to do with truth like this. I don't know who you're going to set free. I don't know who needed to hear it. Um, I don't know what you're going to do in people's lives as they do whatever it takes to make it right. I don't know what it looks like for us to own our guilt but not make condemnation our master. Here's what I do know. I trust you at your word. I trust the truth found in your word. And I have never found it to be anything but life-giving and transforming. And so here's my prayer. That just as you've promised in your word that it would not return void. That you would use it for your glory and for redemption and restoration in your kingdom. Father, we love you. And we pray right now that today would be the day that we quit allowing our past to define us. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say.
thank you that like the prodigal, we can come home. And you await us with open arms. Jesus, thank you that my forgiveness was bought and paid in full with your precious blood. Thank you, Lord, that when you look at me, you don't see that thing or that event. You don't see my guilt or my shame. You see Jesus. You see me covered in his blood, in his redemption, found in his salvation, in his grace alone. God, thank you. Lord, would you help me extend that same grace to others? Would you help me forgive much? Because, oh, Father, I have been forgiven of much. God, help me forgive them, not based on the merit of what's deserved, but based only on what I have received. Lord, let us love and live like you this week. Thank you for speaking to us. God, as we leave this place, would you speak through us? Let us not be the ones who hinder others from knowing you. God, may they, may they know we are your children by our love. We love you, Lord, and we thank you, and we pray all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You are dismissed. Have a great day.